I am Ralph Cancafio. Some of you may either know me or mo know my name. Um, most of you may not. Um, let me explain what, what I'm going to try to do tonight. Um, and I'm going to start with the backwards. I'm going to tell you what I'm not going to do tonight. I, I am not going to spend two hours going through the law of oil and gas. We're going to talk about the law of oil and gas because you really can't understand the big picture unless you understand some of those nuts and bolts. Um, but if you look at the handouts, I, I give that to you because particularly with oil and gas leases, the one more substantial article that's about 50 pages long, that is all law. And if you're in a position where you're negotiating an oil and gas lease or you know someone that's negotiating, that can probably help you. Um, but I'm not going to go through the habendum clause and the shut in well clause and you know all those things tonight. I'll, I'll touch upon some of those things so you understand. What I'd really like to talk about are things like what is going on in the bigger picture in Northwest Colorado. Not so much only oil and gas, but energy. And, and what is going on now? How is today different than? Those of you that were here in the 1980s when we saw that market collapse, you know, what does this mean as we move forward, not only for the rest of this year, but in decades to come? All right? Um, my thought is I'm probably going to go for about 45 minutes or so. We'll take a 10, 15 minute break. I'll come back, I'll do another half hour, um, and then I'll handle any questions you have. If you have a question during the presentation, feel free to raise your hand. If it's going to be a long answer, I may just set you over for the break. But um, sometimes it's a lot easier if you just raise the question right then and there. It's on your mind. Um, I'm always a little reluctant to wait later because you may forget it. Um, this is very casual. If you need to get up and stretch your legs, that's fine. Um, I'm not going to be calling on you. There's no questions that I'm going to be asking you guys. You know, just feel comfortable with the process. All right. So, looking at my notes here, I, I think the first thing you really have to understand, and I guess let me ask a general question. Out of the people that are sitting here, how many are, are landowners that have um, mineral leases on their property? Okay, a couple of you. How many of you are surface owners that have surface agreements but don't own them? Um, all right, well, that gives me a feel. So, so we have some people with some industry experience here. All right, the first thing you have to understand before we get to the big picture is the little picture. And, and the little picture really does deal with law. So what we've seen happening in Moffitt County, and not only Moffitt County, but southwestern, Wyoming, eastern Utah, the entire western part of Colorado, is the first significant part of what is referred to in the industry as a land play. Okay, and the land play involves the Niobrara. So now you've got to understand a little bit about geology, because you may be saying, well, what is the Niobrara? Well, the Niobrara is simply a very, very significant shale formation that is probably, depending upon where you are, about a mile beneath the surface. Okay. Now there's been a real change in the notion of shale. Um, people who have been around this community a long time understand that there have been individuals that have been predicting a shale-based energy um, program for decades. If you study the history of shale, it actually goes back to essentially World War I, when we were trying to figure out how to produce petroleum um, for the armies in Europe. Without boring you with the details of shale, the problem with shale has always been the cost of creating new energy has far exceeded the energy being produced. And that is still the case today. However, Geologically, we know something about shale. Shale is a terrific barrier that keeps beneath it both oil and gas. 
it acts as a trap. It's a natural trap for some major formations. We've known about these formations for a long time. But because of technology, areas that were not commercially productive now are. And you've heard about fracking, you've heard about horizontal drilling, but we'll talk about that in detail a little bit later. But essentially what we're seeing now is in the Niobrara, it's not the shell that's important, it's what's being trapped by the shell. And we now have the technology to access that resource. And folks, that's a game changer. Okay, that's the one thing that really makes what good, what's going on today so much different than what's been happening in the past. Okay, so let's talk about the process. <clears throat> um, I talked about a land play. A, a land play in industry is just when oil and gas operators go into an area to start leasing up properties. The oil and gas lease is the fundamental document upon which the oil and gas industry is based. People ask me, why is there a lease? How come it's not sold? How come there's not a deed? And the wise aleck answer is, because it's always been that way. So what we're seeing, and you probably know a lot of cases where landmen are coming out, they're approaching mineral owners, they're approaching surface owners. Can we lease your property? The typical lease that we see is something called a producer's 88. Producer's 88 is a very industry um, friendly form of oil and gas lease. And, and that's not to say there's anything wrong with it. It's been used in various forms since at least the end of the Second World War. Okay, it's been around a long time. Okay, but essentially what happens is um, when you sign a lease with the company, you have given away your rights to develop the minerals. And part and parcel with that is a covenant basically acknowledging that now they have the dominant interest in the property. What that means is the owner of the minerals in exploring, developing, extracting minerals has a primary right to the surface. It's very counterintuitive. Because you'll talk to people that will say, well, I've been ranching on my property since my grandpa. How is it that they have the dominant estate? And the answer is, that's the law in Colorado. And a lot of laws in Colorado and the West were created back in the 1870s when there was a major, major emphasis on creating economies. Because there weren't a lot of people living in Colorado or Utah or Wyoming or the Dakotas but everyone knew that they were very rich in natural resources. So a public policy decision was made back in the 1870s, after the Civil War, that we're gonna prioritize development of natural resources. And some hundred years later, we're still there. Now there's something called the accommodation doctrine. The accommodation doctrine means now that the operator has to make reasonable attempts to accommodate the surface user. Okay, they can't just run roughshod over you. But short of that, they have the ability to go in and do what it takes to develop the resource, okay? Now, the other part of the lease agreement is just the way it works. There's something called the primary term, and the primary term is that period of time during which the operator, you know, the lessee as it is, <laughs> either comes and drills your property or the lease terminates. Okay, and we can get into, there are a lot of different, there are savings clauses, there are a lot of things that can be done. But essentially, you have a primary term of typically a fixed amount. Sometimes it'll be three years, sometimes it'll be five years. It's whatever you negotiate. Okay, if there's no development in that primary term, the lease goes back to the mineral loan. But if there is production, the lease is said to be held by production, and now it continues in perpetuity as long as you're producing in commercial amounts. Okay? Now, what we generally have seen out in this area, and when I say this area, I'm talking about Craig, I'm talking about Rio Blanco County, um, is starting last spring, spring of 2010, 
we started to see landmen coming out in large numbers to start identifying properties that may be suitable for lease. Okay? And that's going to become important because one of the things that's going to happen is <clears throat> when you have these land plays, you have many, many more acres under lease than the operators can get to during the primary term. So what happens is, as you get to the end of that primary term, you see a second wave of transactions. They're industry transactions. And what you see are a couple of things. You see assignment of leases, you see things called farm apps, where what happens is the lessor starts um, conveying the legal rights to get activity in the primary term to, as they say, save the lease. Okay. So the reality is you see a lot of work at the very beginning when you lease. And you know if you want to really know what's going on, just go down to the courthouse. Moffitt County is one of the few counties in the state that doesn't have the clerk and recorder's site online. So all the landmen have to go down to the clerk and recorder's office. So if you go down there, and they're nice guys, you can talk to them. I mean, they may not tell you exactly what they're doing because you know, it's all proprietary. But if you see a lot of landmen down at the clerk and recorder's office, that tells you there's a play going on. And that's what we've seen for about the last 18 months now. Okay? Now, the second thing that happens is once you get all this property leased up, um, you now get into what I would call the technical phase. Because while there is a right to lease, now the operator has to make some decisions about where do I actually want to drill? So you know, today, the average cost of a drill operation is $1.2 million. Okay, it's very, very expensive. So as you can imagine, they're not gonna start drilling unless they have a reasonable probability of success. So what you see is after you get to that first level of leasing property, and that just identifies, hey, who are we gonna get legal rights from? You get a second phase involving scientific development of resources. Okay? Um, that may be looking at old well logs from existing wells. Um, today there's a lot of work being done with satellite um, so that you really don't have to even get on the ground, you just sort of look. Um, we've gone from seismic, uh, which is basically vibrating the ground very violently with these very large outlets um, that you know will take up you know hundreds of acres when they do it. They can do traditional 2D seismic, they can do 3D seismic, and they can even do something called 4D seismic. All right? 2D seismic is just, you know, you, you picture the piece of paper, it's just flat. 3D seismic is looking at a reserve oriented by three dimensions. Okay? 4D sounds fancy, but it's not. The fourth dimension is just time. It's a prediction of where the 3D images are going to be at various points in time so that you can develop and figure out where a reservoir is, okay? So anyway, the operators have gone out, they've leased the property, they've done their scientific work, and you know, keep in mind, because you know, I had this conversation today with a different client, um, and the question really came, well, are they really gonna drill this year? And this was my analysis, it was like, look, they don't even have the permits from the county to do the seismic work. Even if they somehow were able to get that right away, just to drill, they're gonna to have to do the following. Um, they're actually gonna to have to get crews out there and do the seismic work, which means before they do that, they're gonna get approval from the landowners to come on the property, if not, they're running trespass situations. But even after you do the seismic, then you gotta get it to your technical people, your geologists, your petroleum engineers, you gotta to get to those people to figure out where's the best place um, to spud a well. And then you gotta come back, you gotta go and do a well permit with uh, COGCC, work through that process. Then you've got to locate a drill rig to go out there, and then you gotta get the crews to come on and prepare the site, okay? Long story short, you know, never say never, but very, very unlikely that if they're not even, if they haven't done seismic at this point, they're probably not going to do it this year. All right? But, but my point is, there's a cycle to all this. Okay? So there's a leasing cycle, there's a technical cycle. Okay, the next thing that happens is 
the operator will drill a well. The first one is typically called a test well, just for that reason. One of the things that we've seen is the relative productivity and success of trust test wells are much, much higher now than they've ever been. You'll hear stories about, oh, so-and-so is a wildcatter in western Oklahoma and hit 17 straight wells back in the 50s. I mean, believe it or not, there are people that really don't do any work, but they're very, very few and far between. Anymore, because of the money involved, there is not going to be drilling unless there's a real high probability of success. Okay? So now you've got to go through and do your test work. Okay? Now, once you've done a test well, you got to make some decisions. It may be a dry hole, in which case you've got to consider, okay, where did things go wrong? Okay, it might be a shut-in well. In other words, it produces, but it doesn't produce in a commercially um, significant amount. So you're getting product, but not enough to make money. So you got to figure out, do I do a shut-in or what am I going to do? You know, with natural gas, you may, you may have productivity, but the well's in such a place, there's not a, um, a pipeline nearby, so you have product, but no ability to get to market. Okay, so there are a lot of different things that, that play out. But typically what happens is once you have a successful test well, then you come up with what's known as a drill plan. Okay, um, A drill plan, I tell people, is kind of like the game plan in a football game. Okay? When the Broncos go and play, they have a game plan. Okay? And they kind of stick to it at the beginning. But depending upon what happens in the second and third quarter, sometimes the play, game plan goes out the window. Okay? And what happens here is the, the operators are spending a lot of money. They're very, very careful about what they're doing. So they want to make sure as they move forward, um, they are constantly calibrating the next move. Okay? It's a chess match. All right? And that's what I call the strategic plan. And the strategic planning also includes um, economic planning. Do I now go to my neighbor over here, who is also my competitor, and should we unitize this so that we can start doing some in-drilling to increase the productivity? Should we do that to decrease our financial risk? Okay, the business is very, very fluid. One of the things I tell people is when you negotiate your oil and gas leases, when you negotiate your surface use agreements, make sure you understand those documents and that they're as clear as they can be. Because the guy you're dealing with in 2011 may not be the guy you're dealing with in 2013 or 15. And that's not because they're bad guys. It's a very, very fluid industry. Okay? So now you're into uh, strategic planning. And then the next part of that is... I just mentioned. Even if you're producing, now you've got to make decisions on, well, how do I get this product to market? Your obstacles, if it's natural <coughs> gas, are entirely different than if they're oil. I mean, you, you can't practically get trucks to come in and remove oil, or I'm sorry, natural gas the way you could do oil, okay? All right, so that's kind of the big picture of the industry. So I think that what you're seeing right now is the very, very end phase of the land play, the very, very, very first part of the accumulating of technological information, and we're getting reports back from the first um, set of drills. We're now actually dealing with um, information in the industry. Today, um, the Niobar play has gotten a lot of hype, but no one really knows. All right, a lot of money's been invested. People feel very, very confident that this is going to pan out. But there's certain <coughs> things that you can't control above and beyond the success. Um, right now, one of the big suppressors in the natural gas industry is the price for CFS of natural gas. Back in 2007, it spiked up over $15 a unit. Now it's right around four. That completely affects the economics of what is being done out in the field. However, I'd say it doesn't impact it as much as you would think because these producers are very, very savvy. They're looking at all this with a minimum 30-year investment horizon. So they're not, they've got one eye on 2011, 2012, but their analysis is a lot more sophisticated than that. They're looking way upstream. All right? 
Okay, so is everyone with me so far? Does everyone have questions? Do, do you understand what, what I'm talking about here? Uh, if not, if break, come visit me. Um, if I confused you or you got bored and fell asleep for a second, that's okay. We can go from there. All right, the next thing I'd like to talk about is who is involved? Who's doing what? And one of the things that is happening right now um, is everyone's involved. And when I say everyone's involved, um, uh, I'll give you a little bit of history. And we're also talking about how things have changed and changed very rapidly just over the past couple months. And, and I'm going to start, I, I can touch a little bit about fracking and horizontal drift. Okay? Um, first of all, fracking is not new. It's been around for decades. And the best explanation I can give you of fracking is just this. It is the taking of large deposits of rock and splitting the rock to increase productivity, uh, the porous nature of the rock, so that you can accumulate a higher percentage of oil and gas. Even when you're dealing with highly, highly productive oil fields, your recovery hovers at the best at about 50%. Most of the product is still left in the ground, okay? It's improving, okay? And that's one of the things that's going on now is there are fields that were abandoned back in the 50s and the 60s because technology at that point had exhausted the resource. <clears throat> Understand that exhausting the resource means there's still a lot down there. And now people are going back and saying, you know, with the improved technology, we think we can make this productive. All right different issue, we're going to come full circle. Um, I, I presume most people have heard about the Marcellus um, formation in the eastern United States. Okay, It's a very, very large shale formation that runs from the Finger Lakes of New York down through western Pennsylvania, which is where oil was first drilled for successfully by Colonel Drake in 1859, then down through uh, West Virginia and into Kentucky. Okay very, very significant area, and it's the part of the country where a lot of people live. It has very, very good um, economic geographics. <clears throat> um, it had been suspected that there were very, very large reserves of natural gas in that area. Um, but because of the shale, they, they just couldn't even get to it. There was a smaller drilling company in West Texas that went into the Marcellus and went about negative $350 million drilling wells over about a three year period from about 2004 to 2007. Had a few minor successes, many, 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 many failures. So the story goes, um, the engineers are down in the uh, um, lunchroom one day and they're talking about another failed result, they're scratching their head and they're kind of going through, okay, where do we go on? What could we have done differently? And it turns out there's an older driller that's there kind of over here in the conversation and says, I got a question. And they go, sure. They go, have you tried horizontal drilling when you frack? And they look at him they go, we never thought about that. Okay. Traditionally, drilling has been what's referred to as vertical drill. Okay, you put the drill here and you, you basically go straight down. All right, it's not perfectly straight, but it's, you know, it's within certain tolerance. Okay, that's vertical drill. That's basically, you know, what has been done throughout the world primarily for a lot of years. Horizontal drilling is, to me, anything that's not vertical drilling. Because what we can do now is you can come in on a pad and start curving and moving that um, string of pipe. And you can manipulate it if you know what you're doing. You can go out two, three, four miles and access different areas. Okay? 
It's very popular because now you don't have to do new well pads for each new well. You can use existing well pads. It's not as hard on the surface because you're using less surface. Um, it's more expensive because there are a lot of things that could go wrong. Well, the combination of horizontal drilling and fracking <coughs> was a game changer. Because what happened was they found out when they went through horizontally um, and went through a formation and then they fracked, the ability to secure natural gas went through the roof. Okay, And that started the major play out in the Marcellus. And when the play out in the Niobrara began, it was really a natural gas play. It was all based upon, okay, we now have this new technology, we can now access these areas. So you may ask, hey, has that changed? Oh, yes, it has. <clears throat> right now, by and large, and it's not even close, they're searching for oil. Okay, why is that? Well, a couple different things. Um, one you may know about, the other you may not. The one thing you know about is the price of oil. The price of oil, while it's come down a bit recently, spiked again over the past year. So now the economics of oil was huge. At the same time, the price of natural gas was decreasing. So it was a natural substitution. But the other thing that you probably don't know about is Chesapeake, who's one of the bigger players in the oil and gas industry, was able to apply fracking and horizontal drilling up in the Bakken, in the Dakotas, to oil. That, again, was a major um, game changer. Okay? Up until then, you could frack and horizontal drill for gas, not for oil. So now, when you could do it for oil, everything changed. One of the things that changed was um, Carl Icahn, very well-known corporate raider, started buying a lot of Chesapeake stock. He became a major shareholder, and one of the first things he did was he put the screws to the board of directors saying, what are you guys doing? You are way heavy into natural gas. We need to become more oily. We need to diversify. So Chesapeake went through a major change in their whole business plan to start doing more oil. Okay? At the same time, bigger um, multinational corporations like Chevron, that had completely swore off the United States, was now reconsidering. And they're saying, well, wait a second. We need to, be, we need to become more domestic. Okay. So when I was saying a few minutes ago about who's involved in this, and I said everyone, that's why everyone's involved. The bigger players are going for oil. The smaller players are going for oil. They're all looking at natural gas as a longer-term resource. Okay, But it's, it's all going on now. The other thing that's going on as we speak, and it's not getting a lot of press, but it's out there, is the Obama administration is starting to let go BLM leases. Okay, up until now, the administration has taken a very, very um, let me just call it a, it's a passive aggressive position. Their position has been we need to make decisions based upon the carbon footprint and the greenhouse effects before we can make decisions. Okay, um, last month. The BLM leased off over 112,000 acres up in Wyoming. That doesn't sound like a lot in the bigger scheme of things. That's not a huge amount, but that is a significant change in the way our federal government is now doing business pertaining to allowing um, exploration of natural resources. Okay, and, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more um, as to why that is. It has everything to do with John. Let's talk about what? And what not. Okay, I've talked about oil. Okay, oil's all the rage. People are looking for oil. Definitely makes a lot of sense. Natural gas is highly sought after.